All right, tonight we're going to be looking at one of the pioneers of um, faith is Amy Simple McPherson, and she's considered woman of destiny. She lived from 1890 to 1944, and you'll see the reasons why we're doing all of these, again, in this order is because you'll see a lot of these will have relationships with each other, but it was during pretty much the same period when the Holy Spirit was being poured out, miracles were happening, healing, revivals, and she's one of them that we're going to be looking at tonight. Now, what's interesting about her is that she, as I've studied all of these and I've read on these in the past, but she's probably one of the most um, interesting figures that we will be looking at. And she's, she changed a lot. Now, she was born, like I said, 1890 to 1944. So you've got World War I, World War II, the Depression. Um, she went through the, the influenza that sh shut things down in America for a time. So she really was at a, a lot was happening during the time that she was alive, and yet she did way more than a lot of these guys. Um, and you'll see that she changed a lot. And um, we can owe her. Remember when I told you that back in the day, in, in this period and before this period, preachers would read from their, they would write their sermons out and then read from their sermons and they just kept that low monotone um, and if you heard any of the old old recordings you'll know what I'm talking about it was just this put you to sleep type of um, speaker but she did something that paved the way for what you see and how things are being done today in churches and, um, and you'll see how and why she did that uh, it's really interesting she was very theatrical. For instance, and we'll just jump ahead, when she, she built the um, Los Ange Angeles T Tabernacle or Temple in Los Angeles, and, um, but prior to getting to Los Angeles, this is the kind of person she was. Um, she, she grabbed a, 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 one of those metal chairs and went into the street, put it, set, set it down, set, stood on top of it, and just began looking up in the sky and people were walking by, you know, what is she doing? And she was just frozen, like, you know, like that. And she was just drawing a crowd is what she, you know, what she was doing. So after she got about 50 people there and they were all just figure, trying to figure out what she was doing, she jumps up, grabs this, the chair and says, follow me and takes off running. Well, and this is probably, you know, early 1900s. So they're all gonna run after and see what this crazy lady's about. She runs into the mission, or some, some, some building called the mission, and then they all come in there and they sit down, and then she tells, told the people to lock the doors and don't, don't unlock them until I'm done, and she, and she preached. That's how she got her first, <laughs> her first crowd. But um, she would do crazy stunts like that. She'd, do, she'd create her own parades and, and just create a parade. I mean, back in that day, you can do stuff you cannot do today. You know, you've got to keep that in mind. It was a different culture at that time and so uh, she was she was very persecuted by the media and we'll get into all of that but let's let's um, she lived during the height of the Pentecostal movement um, she founded one of the fastest growing denominations and when she built the the Angelus temple it could seat 5,000 people now, you know, understand this is in the 1900 early like around 1920 1930s around that decade 5,000 people this thing, she, she built it during the depression, 5,000 people sat in it, and she had four um, services every Sunday, so you're looking at 20,000 people, and at that time Los Angeles only had about 250,000 people, so she almost had a tenth of the, of the population during that time. She, when she came to Los Angeles, she hit it. She, she took off and she, she got their attention. She got Hollywood's attention. She had actors and actresses coming. They started checking her out. And um, really interesting, we'll get into that. She got really close to Charlie Chaplin, but we'll get into that here in a minute. Let's look at her birth. She was born eight, on October 9th, 1890 in Ontario, near Salford, Ontario. And, um, but she was born in a scandal. Her mother, um, her, her, her husband died and left her with this little girl. So these, these, 
this family called the Kennedys took her in. And, but the mother died. And so she's now an orphan. And the guy's wife dies. So who's left in the house is but the man and this little girl. And um, nevertheless, the husband that brought the woman in, she, of course she dies, and then the little girl, which is her mother, marries this guy. She's 15 and he's 50 years old. And so that was a big scandal, but, it, but, it, but they gave birth to this woman that we're talking about here tonight. So she, she was born in a scandal. Her mother was involved in the Salvation Army um, as, as much as she could be in the ministry. But of course she married the old man and so she um, gave her life pretty much to him. And um, so Amy Simple McPherson, of course her name at that time was not good. Amy, she was in school and was a leader, seemed always to take charge as growing up. She um, became a very good speaker. She won the silver medal for her speech, went on to the nationals and got the gold medal. So this, she's very articulate. And this was at the age of 12. And although growing up in church, here's what she didn't like. She was in the Methodist church, one foot in the Methodist church, the other foot in the Salvation Army. But the Methodist church was very strict, had very do's and don'ts oriented, rule oriented. And she really wasn't into that. And um, they were really against movies. They were against theaters. And, um, but of course she gets an invitation to go to a theater one day. So she sneaks over there to the theater, walking in only to find out half the church is in the theater watching the movie. And that really, you know, the hypocrisy of the do's and don'ts and the strictness, they didn't even really believe in it. So that kind of messed her up. But at the age of 17, um, she's on her way to a drama, drama class and she sees this, this um, advertisement in a local building of a, an evangelist. And she was very interested in it because it was Holy Spirit, Spirit-filled type stuff, Pentecost. So she went there, went there to make fun of it because she saw all the people dancing, having you know, things that she wasn't accustomed to in the Salvation Army or in the Methodist Church. And then this guy named Robert Simple, of course you're going to see that's her name. She's going to end up marrying this guy. He was the speaker. And um, she ends up basically getting saved. Then she ends up getting called into the ministry. I'm going to try to hurry up here. She ends up, trying, she ends up getting called into the ministry. And she starts seeking direction for her life. And ends up joining this Pentecostal movement that she um, that, that sponsored this guy that she ended up marrying, who was the evangelist from Ireland. And um, she gets involved in that. Now, here's the deal. When she falls in love with this guy, he's going on the mission field. And she's like, okay, well, I feel like I might be, you know, be used in the mission field or, or reaching souls. So they go to China. They're not there very long. They've, they've just recently been married. And before they go to China, a guy from the Azusa Street Revival ends up going up to Canada where they're at and tells them about, you've got to come down here to this revival. And they're really interested in the Azusa Street Revival. And they're like, but we've, al we, we've already got plans to go to China, but when we get back from China, we'll definitely check this, this out if, it's, if that revival is still going on. So, but what the stories that this guy told um, Amy Simple McPherson, her husband, she, it never left her. It only gave her more of a hunger for the glory and the, and the spirit and the, and the move of God and everything that was going on at that time. So they go to China, but she doesn't like it there because it's they, they, the, what they eat, they eat caterpillars, they do all kinds of crazy things in their diet. It's culture shock to her. She's not used to seeing this. This is in Hong Kong. And then right outside her kitchen window, a Hindu guy burns somebody alive for something that they did. And it's just really, really, she didn't want to be there anymore. But during that time, her and her husband gets malaria. And they have a daughter at that time as well. Well, now watch. They've only been in China for a short period of time. Only been married a year or so. They get malaria. He dies. So now she's out there all alone with a child. And no money to get back home. And so she cries out to God, Lord, do you want me to stay here and continue this? I know you've called me to the ministry. What do you want me to do? Now... The reason why we're, we're looking at these, these stories because when you see how God moves miraculously in the lives of these people that are ordinary just like you and me, okay, 
then you know God can move in your life. And whatever God's called you to do in life, we need to start expecting some supernatural things because we can't get things done in the natural. For instance, you only make $20,000 and you've got a dream and you've got a vision. How far is that $20,000 going to take you? But if it's something that God's called you to do, He's going to finance. But if we're open to seeing that, hey, God, look how God is moving the lives of these people. He can and will move in, the, in our life. And so, again, we're limited. I mean, whether we're born on the wrong side of the track or we've got a, you know, we don't have the opportunities that other people have. The fact is, if God's called you, you need that supernatural on your natural. And a lot of people just get stuck. And they can't go any further because they're, they don't realize that they're, they're trying to do it in the natural. And, and that's okay, but you need the supernatural on it to go beyond what you would normally and, and you know, be at the right place at the right time, making the right connections, talking to the right people. And, this is, and you're going to see this is, starts happening with her. So she's over there in Hong Kong, and she can't get back home, doesn't know whether, but she feels like she's got to go back. She's got the child. <coughs> in fact, the, the, the guy dies before the, the daughter is even born. She, he dies a month before she has the baby. So, um, so get this. So he dies, right? She doesn't have enough money for the funeral. She doesn't have enough money to survive on or even get back home on. She's got nothing. So the day before the funeral, so he dies. The next day is the funeral, and she gets a letter in the mail from the United States. Now, you know you can't get a letter that quick. <laughs> it takes days for it to get from you. So but she opens it up, and this woman says, um, God laid me on your heart and told me to give you all the money that I have right now. It's sixty dollars. That's a lot of money back then. And um, and here it is, and it's cash. And she's like, now there's no way. So that means God had to wake this woman up before the man died. However many days that would have been to get that money there. And the woman said. Lord, I got to go get a check. I got to get a money order. I don't know. I'm not sending cash. And God says, "Don't worry. I'll take you. Don't put cash in an envelope." She, he says, "You put cash in the envelope, and I'll watch over it." And um, so she gets that. And then right after that, her mother wired her some money to get her back home. So now she's back home. She's got her daughter now, and um, she ends up going doing ministry, doing some things, preaching and teaching and. She's just um, doing her thing and then ends up getting married again. And about around 1912, she ends up getting married again. And um, this guy, his, his last name's McPherson. So Simple, Simple dies, Mr. Simple dies, and she <laughs> marries Mr. McPherson. And it gets crazy. It will even get crazier than that. Now, these are people that are flesh and blood like us, make mistakes, screw ups. We're, I mean... And that's the beauty of all these guys we looked at is that I can find scandal in a lot of their lives, a lot of sin going on. They, they're not perfect, and yet the Spirit is on them, and they're doing the work of the Lord. People are getting saved. People are getting healed because it's, it's not what you think it is. God's no respecter of person here. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance, and that God still uses sinful saints. And we're going to see that, especially in her life. She's not perfect. Far from perfect. So she marries this guy and, um, and this other guy. And they're getting ready to um, go, go do some things. And she ends up um, falling and breaking her leg and so forth and so on. And her ankle. And so she ends up barely able to walk. And any time she puts her foot on the ground, it's painful as all get out. If you ever broke a foot or an ankle, any any weight on that, excruciating. So she's a, she's sitting there, and God says, if you have that preacher over there, that your husband's at the meeting right now, if you get to that meeting and you ask that preacher to pray for you, I'll heal that. Now her toes are are um, black, bruised ankle, um, toes are black with a cast on. So she wobbles her way there in pain and agony. Has the guy pray for her. And miraculously, the, the pain is gone. She gets them to cut the cast off. And this is in front of thousands of people. And she dances all night long, whereas she barely got there. 
But after being healed, she was able to dance. And that was her first encounter of divine healing that God was going to use her to um, usher in a, a move of healing wherever she goes. And that's what eventually happened. So anyway, um, she starts preaching and um, things start happening for her. And then um, recovering, you know, like I said, she gets remarried, recovering from the past marriage. Then she has a son with the second guy. So the first, she has a daughter with the first guy and a son with the second guy. And the ministry gets renewed. So she's working around the community, preaching and teaching and doing all kinds of things. And um, her marriage starts getting in trouble. Because this guy is a banker. He doesn't want to be on the, on, the, on, the, on the evangelistic trail going back and forth all over the place. He wants her at home. He wants you know have the kind of life everybody else has. But that's not the kind of life that God had called her to. So probably should have talked that over before you got married. And so it got so bad that she finally just wrote a letter, got up early, early one morning, wrote a letter, took her two kids and says, hey, we're going, you can follow us, we'll have a happy marriage, but I, I, can't, I can't live this kind of a life. Now, that rather right or wrong, but this is, where, this is where she was and this is what happened. Well, eventually he catches up with her, but the, the time distance had been so far apart that um, it doesn't work out. And so he, ends, so he ends up divorcing her and going on and marrying somebody else and having the kind of life that he wanted. So her mother steps in and um, starts helping her with the ministry. Now I'm just giving you the, this is all just foundational. Wait till, wait till we get to Los Angeles. Then you're going to see some things happening here. So during this time, um, she's preaching, she's teaching, and she's making her way to Los Angeles. She does her first publication. Um, called The Bridal Call, starts off being four pages, ends up being 16 pages, it takes off. Her ministry starts growing, um, a thousand people per meeting, people are being healed, people are being saved, the numbers were soaring, um, but her personal life was suffering, and um, the divorce and all that, that it took place. So she arrives in Los Angeles in 1918. So that gives you, gives, gives you kind of like a, a little feel of now, now really is where we're going to take off, in, where her ministry takes off, when she arrives in Los Angeles. Two days after she arrived, she preached to 700 people, and by early 1919, the aisles and the, floor, the floors, the window sills, um, the, in the Philharmonic Auditorium were packed with people that would come to hear her. Now while she's building the temple, it's going to cost $300,000 to build this temple in that day. While they're building the temple, she goes to San Diego to preach. <coughs> And when she gets there, they already know about her because of the reputation she's getting in the other states. So when she gets there, her, you know, she, she, has, a, she has some credit and um, her, she's got some fame going on there. So when she gets to San Diego, she doesn't even realize this, 30,000 people show up. And we've got, we, we don't have pictures because the pictures are really white. They would have just, they wouldn't have came on the screen. But there's, you can look them up. This woman here, by the way, if you Google her on YouTube, there is a plethora of stuff there to, to find more. And then they've got actual audio of her and um, so forth and so on. But anyway, so she gets to San Diego. 30,000 people show up and she's overwhelmed because they're coming to get healed. Now, she's, she's just less than 1,000 people showing up in, in places. Her auditorium of 5,000 hasn't been built yet, so she doesn't have a venue to, to have that many people, or hasn't had that many people, but when she goes to San Diego, uh, let me give you an idea. In Baltimore, it got so bad in Baltimore, Maryland, that the firemen had to come and stay in the building all night because people would hide in the attic hiding behind wiring, the ladies would hide in the bathrooms, others would in the basement because they wouldn't leave the building because they wanted to get a front seat row the next day. So they, this is how big this, this was. This was but these people were not going to leave the building because they wanted to have a front row seat the next day. So these firemen had to go in there and empty the place out and then guard it because it got that bad. So she was getting a lot of fame. Things were taking place, healings and miracles. And you just couldn't keep people away. So when she gets to San Diego, there are crutches and wheelchairs and sick people on pallet, and she's freaking out because now this is it. If, I, if nobody gets healed, 
They're going to run me out of town. It's going to get to Los Angeles. This thing's over with. So she's like, God, hey, you're the healer anyway. It's not me. So the first one they bring up is not somebody with a headache, right? Or back pain that you can just say, yeah, they got. This woman has been in a wheelchair since she's been a child for whatever reason. She, couldn't, she hasn't been able to walk since she was a little, little kid. So she is an adult, an older lady who's been in a wheelchair for, I would say, 50 years because she's an older lady. And they wheel her up to her and she's like, oh man, here we go. This is it. Do or die. So she goes over and she lay hands on the, and they've got pictures of this. And they've, they've, they've got video. I don't know if they've got video, but they've definitely got pictures of her in the wheelchair and then her standing up and then her dancing all over the place. And she walks home. And that's the end. I mean, that's the beginning of, of, of her. So when she gets back to Los Angeles, it's happening for her. Things are happening. People are, I mean, and the healings continue to take place. So um, here's another interesting thing. So she is the first woman who has traveled from, from one side of the from East Coast to the West Coast several times back and forth in a car with two kids by herself. Because back in that day, you, you just didn't travel by yourself as a woman. And like I said, it's not interstate. You're going on old roads, rural areas, all kinds of crazy roads to get from one town to the next. And it was hard traveling. Um, flat tires, common, back in that day. And, um, but so, what she's, but so, so, she's, so she was the first woman who did that. She's the first woman who owned the first Christian radio station. And she'll put the towers around the building that she's going to build at the Los Angeles Temple. And, 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 and the, so these towers are going to go up. And if you take a picture of it, I should have got a picture of it. It's really cool looking. But they, the, it's like a dome looking building. Um, it's still there to this day. I think um, Tommy Barnett's boy got it, calls it the Dream Center now or whatever. But anyway, um, first lady to have a radio station. And they only had three radio stations in California, or two. Now, she would be the third radio station in California, but she's the first woman and the first Christian in the United States with a, with a radio station, 24 hours a day. It's still going on. That, that radio station still, is still alive and still moving, still doing its thing today. And so she had that going on. And then she starts a, um, a Bible college, and it, it just gets filled with lots of people come and graduate out of that. She starts the, her own denomination called the Four Square. I don't know if you're, have you ever heard of Jack Hayford? He's Four Square, so he kind of made Four Square a little popular in our in our day. But um, but anyway, and it's still going on. So um, the radio station's going on. These all these church Four Square churches are going on, and so what she did in this short amount of time, being a woman, you couldn't even preach being a woman during this time. They weren't even allowed to vote back in that day. And so everything was against her, you know, divorced, <clears throat> a widow, divorced, and being a woman, and yet she accomplished all this. Well, so while she's in Los Angeles, Hollywood takes notice of her. She built this, tab, this, this church, not, and it didn't look like any other church, it looked like a studio. It looked like a movie studio where you would go in a big auditorium. And, um, they were so jealous, Hollywood, Hollywood producers and directors were so jealous of that building that they were praying and hoping that she would fail and they could come and pick it up, pennies on the dollar or whatever. And they could, the acoustics were amazing. Um, you can get pictures of it on the internet. You can see all this. This is all documented stuff. And, but here's the deal. Back in that day, religion and entertainment, mm-mm. Didn't mix. You might as well came in there with a with a with a steel, you know, liquor, and the church. I mean, you know, <laughs> cigarettes and liquor and the church didn't mix then. Theaters didn't mix. Entertainment and the church back then were enemies. The polarized opposites. So, um, so the, I have a, I have this I have it down here somewhere. Um, here are some of the people: Mary Pickford. Jean Harlow, Clara Bow, um, Charlie Chaplin, and Anthony Quinn played in her band, but the, well, the one that she got the closest to was Charlie Chaplin. Now, just like Hollywood today, you know, you don't really want to be known as a conservative. 
because you know you might not get your your parts. It's also that way you really didn't want to side up with religious people during that day. So and and she couldn't side up with Hollywood people because she'd be scrutinized from her side, and actors and actresses would be scrutinized if they're you're going to church. You know, this was just because because religion and entertainment didn't mix just like politics and religion doesn't mix and when you do you know you get a lot of controversy and stuff but Charlie Chapman would, would get with her and he would share the kind of stuff that he did because she was very theatrical she'd do illustrated sermons she was doing things and this is why I say she changed how we preach the gospel because as I said she did she was very theatrical she brought a lot of stuff into the church that we that, that we just didn't do, and what you see people doing today is a result of her changing the way things are done. I mean, no one had radio stations. She all before she died, she had and she had a license for the first Christian television station. She probably would have done it had she not died, because she just had that momentum going. She was able to get things done. So her and Chaplin would get together, have dinner with each other with their families. And he would share what she was doing, and she'd use it in the church. She would share what she was doing, and he would use it in Hollywood. And they would go back and forth, and they were, the cl they were close, but they had to do it secretly. No one really had to, you know, it wasn't something that you broadcasted, because they, each side didn't want to get scrutinized over it. So with the school, the radio, and, and all the prestige and everything happening, she has a breakdown. She's single at that time. She has like a nervous breakdown where she suffers from not getting enough rest. I mean, you think about it. You got all this stuff going on and you're preaching. She not only preached four times on Sunday to, to 5,000 or 20,000 people altogether, she preached 21 times a week and in charge of radio and in charge of all the different ministries. She would do parades in Los Angeles. She always had something going on that, and it finally got to her. She wasn't getting any rest. And so she was down for a while. But when she came back, she came back vibrant and um, <laughs> gets remarried again. And um, so she gets married to this guy. She, she was very lonely as a woman. You know, some, some women get lonely like that, I guess. And um, she marries this guy. And come to find out, he's promised to marry somebody else. And back in that day, when you make those promises to marry somebody else, they can take you to court, which this woman did. And um, I guess this guy was kind of rich because, from what I read, um, the woman got $200,000 out of it. And so, um, but, but Amy's like, okay, we'll deal with it. I'm going to go off and do my thing. I, I think she went to sit down to South America or somewhere and preach somewhere. And while she was going, um, pre preaching, I guess he divorced her and, um, and took off. So that didn't last hardly at all. That was just as quick as, and um, so you know, you, you, these are the things that happen. These are, these are the crazy things that happen, but that's not the craziest thing. This woman had a lot of crazy going on around her. So she gets kidnapped by maybe the KKK, they don't know for sure. But it was, um, it was a stunt not on her part, but on their part, and it didn't work out well. But she, she got out of that. Um, there's a lot of mystery around that. But the second kidnapping was a weird one. So they're building the tabernacle. They're building that, that Los Angeles um, tabernacle, the temple. And um, so she goes to the beach to spend some time there and do some things. And from her side of the story, She's, she's there, and this guy comes up to her and says, Hey, you, are you Amy Simple McPherson? And she said, Yeah, yeah. And um, she's, they said, uh, My daughter's in the, we've got a baby in the car, and she needs you to pray for her. You know, she's dying. And if you would come and pray, my wife's up there with her right now. She goes, Yeah, I'll, I'll come up and pray. I mean, this woman's seen miracles left and right. Said, yeah. So as she bends in there, he pushes her in. She grabs her, the chloroform, to the mouth. And she's passed out. She wakes up, doesn't know where she's at, in a cabin somewhere, doesn't know where. And this goes on for days and weeks. And on the other side, people who don't know what happened, they think she drowned. So if you go to the newspaper articles and pull them up in Los Angeles, you're going to see, you're going to see, they called her Amy. I mean, she was in the papers all the time. Everybody knew it. Remember, 250,000 people. And by the way, when she showed up, 
Los Angeles population so happened to double and goes to almost a half, half a million people just like that. That's how quick that city grew. But, um, but the paper says she drowned because that's all they knew. She went to the beach. She must have drowned. Well, she was kidnapped. 32 days she was gone. So how she got out of it was the lady went to go to the grocery store and she was able to get undone there from, what, from being tied up and takes off. Well, she realizes, crap, I'm in a desert. She didn't know where she's at, so she just keeps walking. She what? They took her to Mexico the, on the borderline. She's walking. She walks into Douglas, Arizona, and the first cabin she sees, she's banging on the door trying to say this who she was, maybe that they would know who she was, and they were like, we well, so She goes to another one. Finally, someone lets her in, and um, they were able to call the authorities, and so she comes back with the story. Well, the state decided to charge her with fraud, that that was not what happened. They don't think that that's what happened. So she had to go through all this court thing. She ends up winning, but she bounces back. People you know, don't take the state serious. They believe that she was kidnapped. I don't know. Um, but the fact is, if you, if you look up the records of this, the, the judge ends up in San Quentin. The prosecutor ends up in jail or something. And then her, the district attorney or her attorney um, dies. Almost everybody that was involved in calling her out as a fraud was in, had, was in some type of mob action. But that's all documented. I'm just telling you, this is not made up stuff. This is all stuff you can re research and find out on your own. So she's had a very lively life. Okay, a lot going on, but she's accomplished so much. So by 1944, her health is in pretty bad situation. Um, and so what ends up happening is that her son by now is older and he's helping her do administration. When you got that much stuff going on, you need administrative help and that's, what, that's not something she did. Her mom helped as much as she could. So anyway, she's not getting any sleep. She doesn't want to have a breakdown again. So the doctor prescribed her barbiturates and she's taking these to help her sleep. And um, so she has a meeting the next day to speak and do something. I can't remember what exactly what it was, but something, something with ministry and speaking. And so she told her son, I'm gonna to go to bed. He leaves and she takes these pills to go to sleep because she had insomnia. She had so much going on, lack of sleep. Takes too many. When the sun comes the next morning, she's not breathing very well. So by the time they, the doctor came or whatever, she's passed on. So she ends up dying in 1944. So that's a huge, big, and again, there's, I'm only highlighting it. There's so much more. It would be interesting. Like I said, there's a lot of videos on the internet about her that you can find more out about her. But um, she, ends up, she ends up meeting um, Mariah Woodworth Etter because that was her, um, her, somebody she looked to. And when she was able to meet her, it was great. But the difference was, catch this, this woman looked like one of those holy holiness women with a bun mm -hmm. and no makeup, all that. That's how they dressed a lot of them back in then. This woman, Amy, had, was decked out in makeup and outfits and everything. And when these two were together, it was polarized opposites. Yeah, um, uh, yeah that's her, her wagon there. She drove around and Jesus is coming soon, get ready. That's what they believe. That will preach the rapture anytime, you know, get ready. But um, anyway, Hollywood loved her. And um, so when you see all, how all these people come together and how they interact, she never did make it to Azusa, but she was very interested in it. And um, I don't think she engaged Dowie or any of these uh, other people, but they were all this, you know, around and around the same time as you can see their dates. But here's where I want to end with is that Catherine Coleman, now we all know that name, I mean, she dies in 76, so I remember as a kid, because you got to remember when, you know, I'm 60, so um, when I was a kid, there's three, three stations, 12 stations, 10 stations, somewhere, you know, in that time period, you, you know, they were adding more. I mean, we had, when we thought we had 12 stations, oh my God, you know, you can't go any more than 13, right? That's it. Can't get any more. I remember Catherine Coleman being on there. Because Sunday morning, you know, you're looking for cartoons. Guess what? There ain't no cartoons on Sunday morning. How many remember that? Huh? No cartoons. All your cartoons were on Saturday. 
So Sunday, you're flipping around with nothing to do, and then all you got is preachers. Um, 700 Club, Pat Robertson, uh, Billy Graham, and then I remember this lady called Catherine Coleman. Well, when I finally got to hear what Amy Simple McPherson sounded like by audio, I thought I was listening to Catherine Coleman. Because Catherine Coleman, I don't, I don't remember her dates, but Catherine Coleman was born later, but was alive and knew of her, and Catherine Coleman was ministering too, so she knew of her, saw her, heard her, and was, and was greatly influenced by her. So we've got Edder, who's a lady, Amy, completely influenced by her, and then we'll come down two decades later, and Catherine's ministry will take off into great healings and so forth. And when we get to Catherine, she's got as, as a crazy story as this one. And the thing is, God, what I love about this, some of these people are crazy. They just do crazy stuff. Stuff you wouldn't do, but you've done stuff they wouldn't do. I mean, it's, we're all in this, this, this thing together. But the takeaway of all this is, no matter, it's not a... See, if Jesus, this is what Paul says. This is what I preached on, on, on Easter. I said, quoting Paul, if Christ did not come out of that grave, if he was not resurrected, we are all still in our sin. That's what he says. He, so I asked the question, well, what's the opposite of that? If he comes out of that grave, then what? Forgive him. We're not in our sins. He'll go into 2 Corinthians 5 and say, He's not, God was in Christ, what you saw on the cross, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins against them. Now why we don't hang out on that scripture and shove it in the face of some of these guys who keep preaching about sin, 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 and in Hebrews chapter 10 says, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2 says, we, are no, we no longer have a consciousness of sin. Wonder why? Because we're no longer in it, and it's not being imputed to us. I can take you to Romans 5 and says, where there is no law, there is no imputation of sin. Well, there is no law because Romans 7 says, Paul says, we're dead to the law. Christ fulfilled it, removed it, no more law. Therefore, sin, you're not accountable for sin when there is no law. Romans 5, you don't hear that either. But you see it played out. Because every one of these people had issues, had sins, and it did not stop God from using them, whether they're raising the dead, whether they're healing the sick, whether they're preaching the gospel. Another one that she came in contact with that um, spoke at one of the churches that they were part of was Smith Wigglesworth. One time, so we got him coming up too, who, who who raised several from the dead. This is all documented. John G. Lake had sixty thousand documented healings, because he 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 made sure that because he was persecuted. Remember, some of these guys went to jail for 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 um, practicing without a without a license, and they're like, no, we're not doctors, we're not healing, God is. But I said all that to say, we. God, is, these are just not single single people. God just, well, just a few will do things. He's raised every one of us. No, not, I, I don't know this, on, on this, this, this level, probably not. But on where you're at, what you're involved in, no matter how small it is or mediocre it is, there is miracles to be had. It doesn't stop. He's the same yesterday, today. God's the same yesterday, today, forever. And where he has you, start looking for the supernatural, not just for the miraculous, but the miraculous on what you do in life. He's called you to do whatever, des whatever desire is in you, whatever, you want, whatever you're doing with your life right now. Where do you think that came from? Your business? Where do you think that came from? It's what God put in us, and that's our mission field. And then he's not only going to finance where he's got you at, he's going to finance where he's going to catapult you from that to greater and bigger things in the midst of that. Because God's not calling you just to hear and that's it. It's to, what did Paul say? He's able to do above and beyond what we can ask or think. Think about that. That's what Paul is saying to us. God is able to do above 
and beyond what our limited mind, because see, we got limited wishes. I can't do that, don't have enough money. Can't do that, don't have the opportunity. I wish I knew that guy, because if I knew that guy, I could get it. That's, that's where you're at. That's where you and I are at. But if we, sit, we believe what Paul says, he's able to do above and beyond what I can ask or think, then I need to just start stepping back and start saying, hey man, the sky's the limit, man. I got a new lease on life now. I, I know now that I need the supernatural on the natural. Because she could not have done all this as a woman. There's no way she could have done this as a woman during this time, during the Depression. So what she pulled off, I mean, let me see if I can find the stats here before I'm, before I'm done. Well, here's one. It's estimated during the Depression, some one and a half million people received aid from her ministry. And it was a, and, and, the, and the state, the city did not like it because they, they said, don't feed these people. We don't know who they are, where they came from. And they wanted to ask questions. And she says, nope, I'm opening it up. Anybody and everybody is going to get aid from me. And so we see that many people that she, that she fed. Um, but she accomplished so much that she, can, she, that she posted 175 songs and hymns. She composed several operas, 13 drama oratories. She also preached thousands of sermons and graduated an estimated thousands of ministers from her Bible college. She had the radio that's still going on today, the denomination that's still going on today, and she's a woman. And has two divorces. Now what's what's limiting us? Nothing. I don't. God's like I see. You don't think He doesn't consider your frame? That's what it says. He considers our frame. He knows our weakness, and yet He still called you. He still chose you. You're still here. You're still alive. There's still a lot that He wants to accomplish. But you're never going to do it naturally. You're never going to do it now. You have to have the supernatural. You got to be open to the, what the Holy Spirit's doing, because willpower and self-effort only go so far. You got to come to the end of yourself. And begin where he is. And let him lead you into whatever he's called you to. And start getting your faith up there. Start believing for the miraculous in your life. In, your, in your, whatever you do in life. Start believing for the miraculous. Because that's the only way. Let me, if you don't believe that. Everything that Jesus did. And accomplished that three and a half years. Was not natural. He didn't trust government welfare. To feed the 5,000. How did he feed the 5,000? Supernaturally. He didn't go to the doctor and say, Hey, you know, I got a, I got a good doctor for your blindness. In Rome, I'll, I'll get, we'll, we'll raise the money and get you that doctor. He's, you get surgery. We, 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 blind Bartimaeus, we can, we can send you to the finest doctors in Rome. How's he healing? Supernaturally. Getting money out of a fish's mouth to pay their taxes. Supernaturally. Everything, I, I challenge, read everything he did. He never relied on natural means to accomplish heavenly business. He relied on the Holy Spirit. He relied on the Father. And they, 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 they came through. And what he did, he did supernaturally. Now go to the Old Testament. Every time he inter, intervenes, Moses, how does he get people out of, the, out of Israel? Or how does Israel get taken out of Egypt? Through the Red Sea. How? By boats? Ferry split. splits the Red Sea. Now they, they, they leave Egypt and they're, they're going to get to the Promised Land. They're in bondage for 400 years. They've never been out of Egypt. How the hell do they know how, where, where they're going? They don't got a GPS. They ain't got a map. So supernaturally they're led to the Promised Land by a fire by night and a cloud by day. And their shoes never wore out. Supernatural shoes. As their feet grew, the shoe grew. Now, if God's showing us that when He shows up, He don't rely on the natural. He never relies. You'll never find a story in that Bible where a man did something in his naturalness. It's always the supernatural of God coming on what the man is doing, or woman, and propelling you way further than you could have ever gotten on your own. And that's why we all, a lot of the church today is living, living mediocre lives. We go so far and we hit a wall. I see it all the time. 
And the, and I'll close with this. They who know their God shall gain strength and do great exploits. And I want to I just want to encourage you. This could be your story. Not exactly, but where you're at, you can do some stuff. You can see some things happening for the glory of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you. God, encourage us through this. That you you raised us up for such a time as this. And if we're just spinning our wheels right now, Lord, yeah, that, that, no more spinning the wheels. We've got vision now. We've got, we've got an impetus now that, Lord, we know we can rise up because you're for us, not against us. You've made us the head, not the tail. You've made us above and never beneath. Now we're going to go out and we're going to do this thing again. Because I don't care how many times we fail. It says the righteous will fail many times, but they keep getting back up. I'm going to continue pursuing my dream. I'm going to continue pursuing this thing. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? I'm rising up again. I'm standing again. And we're going to go again with, with freshness, with, with, with strength, with the anointing of the Spirit now, with the supernatural on this thing. We're not going to quit. Never, never say die. Amen.